everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Shakul Kachwala. He is from High Carb Health, along with his brother, who has an incredible story of healing that is basically miraculous. And he's going to be talking about diet and IBD and giving an evidence-based second opinion. So many people suffer with GI issues, and you don't have to because they got high carb health now to help you. Please welcome Shakul to the show. It's nice to see you again. Thanks, Jeff AJ, for having me on. My pleasure. You know, we did the show a little bit later because you're in Australia. And if you did it at the regular time of 11, it'd probably be like four in the morning for you. So <laughs> that's right. It's still pretty early morning, but um, yeah, I'm very happy to be on and sharing this information with everyone. Nice. Before I know you have a presentation plan, but before you dive mm -hmm. into it, do you want to tell your story, how you learn the truth about high carb for health? Absolutely. So as uh, Chef AJ mentioned, my brother Shamiz was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory bowel disease back in 2012 when he was teaching English in Japan. And he had an extraordinary, ex extraordinary experience where none of the medications were working for him and he had to find another solution. So he found out about diet and lifestyle, the plant-based diet through a book called Self-Healing Colitis and Crohn's by Dr. David Klein. And uh, basically, he was able to come off his medications, uh, change his diet, and had a follow-up follow -up colonoscopy uh, where all his ulcers were gone just because of changing his diet and lifestyle. He's been medication-free for 10 years now. And uh, last year, he ran a marathon. Um, so that was an inspiring, or well, inspired me to, to look into changing my diet and um, the big kind of realization happened for me when I went to visit him and ate exactly like he did for the three weeks that I was uh, living with him. And yeah, basically my, my whole health basically just was transformed within those three weeks. I felt like a different person. And so I never looked back, you know, I got rid of my migraines. I got rid of most of my hay fever. I used to be on antibiotics for acne so lots of different things happened for me as well. And uh, yeah, it's been nearly 10 years for me now. So being on a plant exclusive diet, as you like to call it. So I do like it. Um, I, don't, I don't like based. <laughs> based means it's too vague. That's incredible because, you mm. know, I love to, I, I mean, I obviously don't love to hear that people suffer or have illnesses, but I love to mm. hear that there's, like you say, a, a silver lining in the cloud that when somebody succumbs to an illness, they, and maybe also their family members mm. get a wake up call to change their diet before something happens to them. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, one of the biggest things we like to teach at High Carb Health is, you know, try to prevent it before something happens. Because once it's happened, it's much harder uh, to overcome it than before it's happened. So, you know, I guess Shamiza's story was a wake up call for all of us and our family to, to change our diet. Both my parents are plant exclusive. My wife is, my kids are. You know, so it's, um, yeah, it's been wonderful for us. And yeah, yeah. we'll never look back. That's fantastic. Did, did your brother ever see any of the original doctors that, uh, you know, that diagnosed or treated him and basically say, Hey, I'm better. <laughs> no, he hasn't had a chance to go back to Japan, uh, since then. Uh, I don't know if he'd be able to find them anymore. Um, you know, people change roles and move places and things like that, but, um, yeah, no, he hasn't. <laughs> Does he ever have to go and get any kind of checkups like colon? I mean, he, he had more colonoscopies, I think, than any other human alive during <laughs> a, a period of time. Yeah, I, th I think he was having one quite regularly in that six to seven weeks that he was in the hospital. But no, since he's left the hospital, uh, he hasn't needed to have one. His doctor uh, looks at his stool tests and his blood tests and says, well, there's no way I can refer you for a colonoscopy. Uh, you know, you're, you're running, you're fit, healthy uh so yeah he hasn't he hasn't been referred to get a colonoscopy since he's recovered that's amazing how soon after his recovery did you guys form high carb health together and what is it that you guys do so he was diagnosed in 2012 and we started high carb health towards the end of 2014 and uh yeah i was so we were so inspired you know i started a youtube channel just as a hobby and I, I had him on to share his story and we just started getting questions from people. Oh, how did you do it? What have you done? And we realized, well, maybe we should try and help people. So I 
decided that I'd quit my corporate job and take a big risk and, and start start up, you know, high carb health to try and help people with IBD. And, you know, over the last seven years, we've helped more than 500 people um, improve their quality of life. Um, hundreds of those people have been able to get off their medications uh, and be symptom free of ulcerative colitis so, and Crohn's disease. So it's are been, those the two, basically, when you say IBD, those are the two main diseases that fall under? Those are the two main ones. And you've got diverticulitis and a few other ones as well. But um, yeah, because of Shamiza's experience, mostly we work with people with colitis and Crohn's, but, you know, we're, we're experienced enough to deal with practically every kind of digestive issue. Uh, we've been able to help people with many different things. Nice. Well, even people that are on medication, it doesn't mean they're, they're better. I mean, they still have, from what I understand, they still have quite a few symptoms. Yeah, we're going to talk about that um, as we go through the presentation. But yes, it's, uh, it's quite shocking when you learn of the success rates of some of these medications that people are told that they have to be on for the rest of their lives. And uh, so it's, it's important to understand that it's not necessarily going to be the, the silver bullet that saves you uh, from, from getting into remission here. Yeah, as like Dr. Goldhammer says, and you can pretty much guarantee when you go on these medications, it's for the rest of your life and you're never going to get well. Percent, yeah, yeah. I love the name high carb <clears throat> health. So many people still are afraid of carbs, even though that's <laughs> all I eat pretty much. Absolutely, I think when we we um when we started out and we thought about the name, we kind of um had discussions long and hard about whether that was the right way to do it. But we feel as though we want to be truthful about what we do, and a whole food plant exclusive or plant based diet is, is a high carbohydrate diet if you do it properly. And if you look at all the research, China study, start solution. These, these, all these, um, and all the research and publications that show how people get better, you know, it's, it's basically a whole food plant-based diet that's low in fat, obviously, then you have to be high in carbohydrates and it's kind of a little bit anti-popular, but I think we want to make people aware of what we're about and, um, it, it kind of sticks with you too. And you know, what's interesting is the opposite of what you teach and what we eat it would be like a high animal product, high fat diet. Where's the evidence that that's ever reversed or gotten any disease better? There isn't any. <laughs> I know. I mean, yeah. there's some short-term studies of, um, you know, diabetes and things like that, where you get into remission, but you don't end up getting end organ benefit and it doesn't actually improve insulin resistance. So uh, I guess you may, I think some of these diets do relieve symptoms in a way, but they don't actually allow the body to heal or you get the benefit from, from actually reversing your disease. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, a lot of people don't think about the fact that animal products and processed food, whether it's vegan processed food or not vegan processed food, have no fiber, like zero oil Correct. has no fiber. So people Correct. with digestive issues, I mean, I know there's sometimes they have to be on less, or diff, you know, at the beginning of their <clears> eating, they can't necessarily <throat> eat the way we are, but how is that going to help anybody's microbiome to just eat a bunch of fat and meat? There's so much research Paige, over the last 15 years about how important fiber is for our gut bacteria and for our health and for our immune system. And so when you take away fiber from your diet, you're doing a real disservice to yourself and you're feeding the bacteria that you don't want. And um, that leads to all sorts of problems. And, you know, even the people that relieve their symptoms going on a low fiber diet with these digestive issues, as soon as they try to eat a fruit or vegetable, they have a huge amount of discomfort. And so if you, if you have that, you're not really in a healthy state, I don't think anyway. Um, so it's really important to understand what the science says that we need to follow a, a diet that's high in fiber, um, you know, as, as Dr. Barnard or um, McDougall would say, at least 30 to 40 grams a day. Um, well, most people have been doing this for a long time, eat a lot more than that. You know, be, I mean, Shamiz and I will be close to anywhere between 70 and hundred grams of fiber every day. So, uh, your brother was pretty young when he was first diagnosed, wasn't he? It's 22. Yeah. 22 or 23. Yeah. Wow. Did, did other people in your family suffer with any digestive issues? Uh, I used to suffer from constipation. Uh, but, um, yeah, I think, I think most people, if they're on a kind of standard Western diet or a standard American diet, suffer from some form of digestive issues that they just put up with and they don't really think about it. They just think, oh, you know, this is just part and parcel of my life and, and not realizing there's something they can do about it. Yeah. Well, they just take the little purple pill or whatever color <laughs> these days. Yeah. yeah. So then, then they can eat the crap that made them sick in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So nice. Um, 
Yeah, so I've got a presentation to go through where we can talk about some of the things we just kind of discussed. So maybe I'll share my screen. Great. And so we can go through. There we go. Let me know if you can see that. Perfect. So what I wanted to share with the audience today, if, if you've been diagnosed with an IBD or a digestive complaint and you've gone to see your gastro, most likely the majority of people get told the diet has nothing to do with their inflammatory bowel condition. And so I just wanted to go through and share some of the information and the evidence where we can see the research behind diet and IBD. And I, I wanted to kind of give an evidence-based second opinion here uh, to kind of show that actually there is something, you know, and you think about it, Chef AJ, isn't it crazy to think that what we eat has nothing to do with our digestive disease? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So, you know, we're going to go and just uh, change the thought process around that. Um, so just to give you a brief introduction, my name is Shakul and I'm the co-founder of High Carb Health along with my brother Shamiz there. And uh, we've been helping people overcome inflammatory bowel conditions for the last seven years. And we've helped hundreds of people recover from their condition and become symptom and medication free share with you a couple of pictures of what it looked like when Shimizu was in Japan. So this is the kind of stuff that he was dealing with. He wasn't being, he was being tube fed. You can see that um, through his neck there. Um, and this was an LCAP machine where they were trying to filter his blood um, to try and help uh, clean out the bacteria, but that wasn't, wasn't actually the cause of his condition. So it didn't really help. And he had to go through that, I believe nine or 10 times in the hospital. And he, just, and he had to sit there or lie there for an hour. And at this stage, he was going to the toilet 20 to 30 times a day with bloody diarrhea. So you can imagine how uncomfortable that would have been. And this is his transformation story. So you can see from hospital to, to healing on a plant-based diet. And um, yeah, he's thriving now. He's just about to run uh, one of the hardest races in Australia. It's called the Pyramid Race. It's a 14 kilometer run. And halfway through, you have to run up a thousand meter mountain. So, which is, which is a very steep hill to climb. So he's very excited about that. What are we going to talk about today? So we'll go through initially the, the current practice for IBD treatment. And then I'm going to talk you through the evidence for pre prevention of IBD and also what evidence exists for treatments. I'll discuss why plant foods help. And I'll take you through a couple of case studies of um, one for Shamiz to show the colonoscopy evidence of how the diet was able to reverse uh, this condition. At any time, if you have any questions for me, Chef AJ, please feel free to ask. So the big question, food has nothing to do with IBD. Yes, I'm scratching my head too. How can the food have nothing to do with my digestive condition? And the number of people that we speak to on a daily basis that tell us their gastroenterologist or their, diet, um, their dietitian or their medical team are telling them that they can eat whatever they want and they just have to take these pills and... Um, Kind of get on with it and every time they ask me well is there anything i should do my diet the question is always no 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 food has nothing to do with ibd so let's look at the standard medical practice i guess when you look at medication and medication i'm not against medication uh, there are times where we need the medication especially in emergencies uh, ibd is a very serious condition and there are certain situations where you're going to need to stabilize your body and and get some relief so uh, medication has a role to play. It's important. Um, but our main kind of thought process at High Carb Health is we don't want to be on medication for the rest of our lives. And if there's something we can do about it, we should look at the research and think about what, what we can do to try and uh, either reduce the reliance on the medication we're taking or um, eventually be able to get off our medications and ideally uh, in, con in consultation with our doctor. So the thing is with the medication, though, that it only suppresses symptoms. If you look at any medication packet, you will see that it says temporary for temporary relief of symptoms only. So you're never actually targeting the root cause of what caused your disease in the first place. Uh, and if you think diet has nothing to do with IBD, then according to the medical practice, it doesn't matter which path you take, it's not going to do anything uh, about your symptoms. Whereas, as we know, Chef AJ, that if you turn right, you're going to be going down the path of broccoli and fruits and vegetables, and that's going to give you the fiber compared to this processed um, rubbish, I would say. We're looking at that. Um, 
but um, yeah, uh, our, our main issue is that you never get to the root cause when you when you choose the exclusively the medical only route. Okay, so standard medical practice. So here's I'm going to be going through a few studies here today. So uh, bear with me if you're if you're following uh, on on the video feed. But I think it's very important that we share the science about this. Okay, so this is a study. We're looking at the remission rates achievable by current therapies for IVD. So the first type of medication that most people get on put on is a type of mesalazine ASA or steroids. And we only find that 20 to 55% of people on those medications enter remission. So you've got you know, anywhere between 45 and 80% of people that don't get relief in, on their initial course of medications. So then they've got to be put on some stronger medication. Uh, and these medications tend to look at um, suppressing the immune system. So things like azathioprine and, you know, you only found remission maintained for a year for about 60% of people. So 40% of people aren't actually achieving remission. And another type of medication, methotrexate, 30 to 60% fail to achieve remission over a 40 week period. So the odds aren't, aren't looking that great here. So when these fail, people start to go on these biologic infusions. They got infliximab, adalizumab, sertilizumab. Um, but what we found in this review was that we've got remission rates of under 35% for these medications. And the review also found that approximately one in five people who have to take biologics need to requ need require some kind of surgery, intestinal resection after two to five years. So I don't know about you, um, Chef Pedro, but those aren't great odds to me. Mm -mm. So what the conclusion of that study was that, you know, in this new era of all these biologic, they're very expensive medications, you know, some of them up to $40,000 a year. Um, the proportion of patients with inflammatory bowel disease not entering remission remains high. So we're not really, even though, you know, the doctors are saying you need to be on these medications and you need to be on them for life, most people aren't getting the relief um, that they would be looking for when they're on these medications. <clears throat> So here's another study that, um, that looks at uh, the biologics and, and what they found was that this is a really scary thing, right? So not only are you on these medications for life, but um, you're increasing your risk of infections, malignancies, and, and some types of cancers, especially non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So you're not necessarily getting better, but you're also increasing your risk of all these diseases as well. So what about prevention? Could the food we eat really play a role in the health of our digestive system? It almost seems so obvious, doesn't it? Um, and, well, you know, our answer is yes, but let's have a look at the, the evidence that, that discusses the, the difference between diet and IBD. So here's a, in fact, it's funny, you know, Shamiz was diagnosed in Japan and there's a huge amount of research being done in Japan regarding IBD. <clears throat> so here's a study which they looked at dietary intakes uh, for Crohn's disease. And they actually reviewed uh, these cases for 19 years. So it's a long-term study. It's not just a short-term thing. Um, and what do they find? They found a very strong correlation, Chef AJ. Um, you know, the, the chances of them being wrong is, is about one in a thousand. So they're pretty, pretty, um, pretty confident here that they've got this right. And the cor correlation of Crohn's disease incidence with increased dietary intake of total fat, animal fat, and um, poly omega-6 fatty acids. So what they found is increased animal protein being the strongest independent risk factor for developing Crohn's disease. And look at that correlation. Their P is less than 0 0.001. Uh, here's another in, uh, study, animal protein intake and the risk of inflammatory bowel disease. This is a 10-year study, and they concluded that high total protein intake, specifically animal protein, you see this is a common theme as I run through these, this research, okay, including fish. And a lot of people seem to think that fish is a healthier uh, type of um, animal flesh when, you, when it comes to IBD, but it isn't. Uh, and this was associated with a significantly increased risk of IBD. Okay, so high animal protein intake was associated with a three-fold increase in IBD risk. Um, this is a study that looked at uh, intake of dietary fiber in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. 
And they found that long-term high intakes of dietary fiber, especially from fruits, was found to be associated with the lowest risk of Crohn's disease. Okay, and so a lot of the doctors are putting people on low, low residue and low fiber diets. They're doing the exact opposite of what's necessary to get people better from these conditions. And this is another disease. This is another study done in Japan. They're looking at lifestyle-related uh, disease and Crohn's disease. They're looking here at a semi-vegetarian diet. Uh, so it's not even a fully plant-based diet here, but even in, in, in this, you're seeing that increased intakes of animal fat and animal protein uh, related to increased rates of Crohn's disease. Uh, and also if you decreased your fruit and vegetable fibers, you showed an increased risk of IBD. Uh, and the other thing we were talking about, the microbiome, is diets rich in animal protein and animal fat cause a decrease in beneficial bacteria in the intestines. This is my favorite one. It's not, not because of what it showed, uh, Chef AJ, but because of the title. Diet and inflammatory bowel disease. If you're any kind of researcher and you can't find this study, <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to look for. And so for a doctor to tell someone that diet has nothing to do with IBD, I mean, it's glaringly obvious here. So what did this study find here? The Western diet high in fat, particularly saturated fat, can induce endotoxemia. What is endotoxemia? Well, endotoxemia is a type of toxicity that's produced by bacteria when they consume uh, foods that are high in fat and animal protein. So this goes into your intestinal lining and causes low-grade inflammation. And over time, it's going to create lots of damage into your bowel. We also see here that um, one of the factors for IBD is a... Uh, having an incorrect ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. So most people on the standard American diet are getting like 20 to 30 to 1. So 20 to 30 points of omega-6 to 1 of omega-3, where you actually need you know, 1 to 1 or 2 to 1. Uh, so they're really on the wrong side of the coin here. So in, in terms of a total summary of what you need to do if you want to prevent IBD. So this is for everybody sitting there that hasn't got it. And you're thinking, well, what do I do to make sure I don't get these? These are scary diseases. You know, people with colitis and Crohn's can be having, you know, anywhere between 10 and 20 bloody bowel motions a day, lots of diarrhea, pain, cramping. It's not nice. You don't want to get one of these. So do everything you can to avoid it. Um, what you need to do is avoid animal protein and fat and reduce your total, can to reduce your total fat content. You want to stay away from milk proteins. You want to reduce the amount of omega-6 fatty acids in your diet. Uh, stay away from food additives, junk, processed and refined foods, and you want to avoid high processed sugar intakes. This is all the kind of stuff that we talk about anyway um, when we're talking about a whole food plant-based diet, but it's nice to see that the evidence is supporting that. And what you want to do, increasing in your diet or exclusively focusing on fruit, vegetables, starches, whole grains, um, you know, even legumes and nuts and seeds if you're looking for prevention. <clears throat> So now looking at evidence for treatment. So, you know, there's, there's one thing to say, okay, sure, cool, you're looking at prevention and, and that's all good and good. But what if you've already got an IBD? What can you do? What does the evidence tell us in terms of treatment of IBD with diet? Well, you know, do you really have to rely on medications and drugs for the rest of your life? Um, well, we say no. And I think Shamiz is clear evidence of that. He's been on, he's a med medication free for 10 years uh, and successfully treated his IBD and so have hundreds of other uh, clients of ours. Here's the first bit of research, uh, evidence-based dietary advice if you've got an IBD. <clears throat> so that's a 2013 review. And what it showed what they wanted, they recommended low intake of animal fat, meat, margarine, and processed fatty foods containing emulsifiers. Sounds like good advice. Uh, there's another study looking at Crohn's disease. So they looked at, they started off with some, with uh, enteral nutrition, which is kind of tube feeding, but also a very strict diet. So the strict diet avoided animal fat, high sugar intakes, glialdin and consumption of emulsifiers, maltodextrin. That's something if you see when you're looking at foods and especially packet foods, if you turn around and look at the ingredients, you see emulsifiers and maltodextrin, especially if you've got an IBD, stay away from that. And I think everyone should stay away from those in any case. Uh, so these, these people obtained excellent response and remission rates, uh, both adults and children. So I looked at a 70 to 80% uh, remission on this kind of uh, process, which is way better than what the medications were, were providing. Uh, this study looks at dietary fiber and it says it's not harmful, but it's favorable, favorable for Crohn's disease. 
So they looked at a plant-based diet and said it's not only effective for gut inflammation, but also promotes a general health of IBD patients. Uh, so high fiber is not harmful and seems to be favorable, which is again, the opposite of what we've been told by um, most of the gastroenterologists for a long period of time, although that is changing now. Treatment of Crohn's disease with an unrefined carbohydrate fiber rich diet. <clears throat> so they did a dietary intervention in hospital. So what they found was hospital admissions are significantly fewer and shorter. So you're looking at 100 odd days compared to 500 days in the control group. And there was, uh, you know, one fifth the number of surgeries in the diet group. So huge improvements when you're looking at what the standard treatment or standard diet uh, recommendations for IBD is providing. Imagine if everyone was doing this. And they found that despite many programs suggesting a low fiber, low residue diet, these results show that treatment with fiber rich, unrefined carbohydrate diet, diet appears to have a favorable effect. And the, the key thing they found was it does not lead to intestinal obstruction. So many people thinking when they go on the high fiber diet, it's gonna, it's gonna obstruct their inflamed bowel, but it doesn't seem to do that. This is a study looking at ulcerative colitis and dietary factors. And they concluded ulcerative colitis patients who consume more meat, especially red and processed meat, eggs, protein, and alcohol have the greater risk of relapse. It's a running theme, isn't there, Chef AJ? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, what disease is helped by animal products and alcohol? Seriously. <laughs> So this is, a, this is an older study, but it's a controlled therapeutic trial of various diets. And what the study found is that giving milk to patients and remission from ulcerative colitis can cause relapse. And you know what we find on, online is there's a lot of people recommending dairy products for people who've got IBD. And um, the research doesn't show that that's actually favorable. Um, you know, the results show that twice as many patients avoiding milk and milk products remain symptom-free over a year. So get away from dairy if you've got IBD as fast as you can. In fact, it's probably the first thing on top of it to get away from. Uh, this is that um, disease that was, so the study that was done in Japan, again, the semi-vegetarian diet, they actually reviewed treatment as well. Um, and the types of foods that they focused on, diet high in brown rice, miso, yams, lots of yams, seaweed, fermented soybeans, lots of whole plant foods. And um, this was a small study, but they've actually um, done a follow-up to this in a, in a bigger study. They found in 22 cases, there were no adverse effects, such as gaseous distress, just absolutely no adverse effects. And the most amazing thing, okay, was so effective in preventing relapse of Crohn's disease that in the first year, 100% of people stayed in remission and 92% of the, of the group was in remission at the end of two years, okay? And that's compared with relapse rates of 60 to 70% at one year with standard medical care. Look at the improvement there, okay? And this is the most exciting study that's come out, okay? So this is, um, again, in Japan. But what they did was they actually did something very similar to what we do at High Carb Health. They actually ed um, used education while the patients were in hospital. So educating them about why diet is so important, why making changes to diet can be very effective in, in the treatment of IBD. And that's what we do. So when we start with a client, we start with a huge education piece before we actually get into any of the practicalities of diet change. Because you don't only need to know what you're doing, you need to know why you're doing it. And if you feel very prescriptive about telling people what they have to do, it's, you're not really going to get this kind of long-term li lifestyle and habit change that you're looking for. So the focus was on educational hospitalization. Imagine if we did this everywhere. Um, and look at the chain, look at the uh, amazing results, Chef AJ. 98% of the patients staying in remission after one year on a plant-based diet, okay? But the huge, huge thing here is 81% stayed in remission after five years. Wow. <clears throat> if there was a medication that could do that, <laughs> it would be they would be scrambling funny. all over it. They'd be scrambling all over it. But you can't because you, you never, you never, as I said at the beginning, you don't treat the root cause with the medications. And so you're never going to get these kind of results uh, when you look at a pharmaceutical treatment. So just in, in terms of a summary, the treatment for healing IBD is very similar to the prevention plan, but you have to, to uh, put additional thought uh, to spice foods, condiments, wheat, caffeine, artificial uh, sweeteners, all dairy, nuts, citrus fruits, and alcohol. 
So you've got to be a bit more careful. So why do plant foods help? So we're looking, you know, we talked about this before as well, the gut microbiome profile. So um, here's a study that compared two diets, uh, the plant-based one and an animal-based one. We found that in less than five days, dietary intake alters the microbiome community structure and microbiome gene expression. So in five days, you're making changes if you, you know, depending which way you go. Uh, the consumption of a westernized diet, high in animal fat, animal protein, sugar, causes a disruption of the micro, microflora and IBD. So this is why we really need to, you know, exclusively focus on the plant-based foods. High fiber in, intake, increased dietary fiber has favorable, favorable effects. Um, both increased remission and de decreased risk of development. So you really need to focus on high fiber foods. Uh, less sulfur containing um, compounds. So, you know, animal products are the main sources of sulfur containing amino acids. And these um, lead to the production of hydrogen sulfide. You know, I'm sure some of the other guests have talked about hydrogen sulfide gas in the bowel um, and how toxic it is to the colon. And it plays, a, it's definitely been suggested to play an important role in the causation of IBD um, and, and the continuation of it. We want to avoid fillers. So when you focus on whole plant foods, you're not having the fillers and the processed foods and the artificial um, foods. So you avoid exposure to microparticles. Um, so all these are known to trigger IBD. And less toxic byproducts. So animal protein, it putrefies in the gut. So that's where it produces the hydrogen sulfide. And most people don't know this, but on a lifetime on the standard Western diet, your gut bacteria produce the same amount of ammonia as is found in a thousand gallons of Windex. <laughs> that's, that's a lot. Okay, so there's, there's the research. I just wanted to kind of share that with you. And I think... You know, if anyone who's watching this has IBD or knows someone with IBD, please share this video with them because, you know, more likely they more than likely their gastro has told them that um, diet has nothing to do with it. Okay. So looking at some case studies. So this is chemise here. Okay. So apologies if you're eating something, but I've got some colonoscopies to show you. So trigger warning. Um, but this is how bad his colitis was. You can see some of the bigger ulcers inside the colon. And um, this was after following the uh, plant-based diet uh, for just over a week. And um, you can see the improvement in his colon. Um, there's only a little bit of scarring and there's no ulcers there at all. <clears throat> and this is one of our clients in the UK. So he was able to heal and be medication free as well. And you can see in, in the picture on the right there, there's a significant improvement um, and there's no active colitis going on in his bowel. So just to finish off, I just wanted to kind of share with you a little bit about what causes uh, colitis in Crohn's uh, and uh, what you can do about it. So the first thing is we've gone through the research, animal protein is strongly linked to autoimmune diseases, but diet isn't the only factor. So as, we, as we've worked with many hundreds of people, we found that, you know, diet and lifestyle plays a role. So if you've got a, a toxic and stressful diet and lifestyle, including medications, um, you know, you're, you're providing an environment in your body that isn't conducive to health. Uh, and so for healing osteoclitis and Crohn's, you need to focus on a very simple diet consisting of fruits and vegetables, and mostly or totally from soluble fiber. And you also want to reduce the toxic load from your body. You don't want to be creating these endotoxins and poisons in your gut that are going to end up in your bloodstream and, and cause all sorts of havoc into your body. <clears throat> and I also get a lot of questions about inflammation. So, you know, we talk about anti-inflammatory diets and, you know, a plant-based diet does do that. And we don't want to have inflammation for long, long periods of time. But if you actually think about what inflammation is, Inflammation is a normal and positive sign of healing. Now, if you bump your head, it inflames because the body has to send blood to that part of the area to heal, okay? So when we talk to our clients, we aren't demonizing inflammation in the same way. We don't want it to be there for long periods of time, but we understand that there's certain times where inflammation plays an important role in people's healing journey. So um, we want to get rid of it, and that's what the plant-based diet does, but we don't necessarily... Um, want to demonize it either because that's how the body actually uh, does a lot of healing 
Uh, so what is it? So when there is inflammation, the body is sending the immune system or the defense system into the affected or damaged area of the body. So you're sending blood cells, white blood cells, antibodies, more blood, lymphatic fluids, all being sent into the affected area, which causes swelling and inflammation. And so if we want to reduce inflammation, we need to address the root cause, which is don't keep putting fuel on that fire. We need to change our diet and lifestyle. We need to eat the healthy plant foods. And that does the opposite of what the body's trying to do when it creates damage and reverses the damage. And so the body doesn't need to keep sending all that blood to keep healing. And therefore you reduce your inflammation naturally. And so if we address the root cause, which is our diet and our lifestyle, we will eventually get rid of that inflammation over time and heal our bodies. Okay. So that's what we focus on doing. That's what we try and teach people uh, when they have IBD is first address the root cause. And after you do that, the body will take care of the rest. Yeah, well, I, and, addressing the root cause is basically <clears throat> what lifestyle medicine is all about. Exactly, exactly. And, and so that, that's yeah. not what most doctors are. Well, they're not trained to do it. It's not really their fault. That's not what they learn. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. We don't want to blame the doctors. We we really want to educate. And and that's part of what why I wanted to come on and share this is, is the education piece is so important and that we need to be aware that there is so much information and evidence out there about what we can do for IBD. And um, it's just, unfortunately, it's just not put in front of enough people to realize they have got other options and they don't have to just follow, um, you know, be on these medications for the rest of their life. There is something else you can do about it. And I'm very, very passionate, especially after I saw what happened to my brother to, to try and help people and, um, you know, let them know that there is hope and, and, and you are in control. You do have choices. And so it's, it's up to the people, you know, if they want to stay on the medications, they want to make diet and lifestyle changes. That's fine. That's their choice. But if you, we should give people the, the alternative and show them this evidence that it does exist. And if you're willing to make the changes, you can have a different, different outcome for your health. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we've got a bunch of questions in the chat. If you'd like to answer. Okay. Yeah, up. absolutely. Okay. Let me just uh, stop well, the first this. one came in actually before you started your presentation from Joan and she said, well, is IBD and IBS similar? Are they different? They're different. Um, I guess, you know, um, with IBD, you've got inflammation that's apparent in the bowel. So you, the bowel's it's inflamed, it's angry, you've got blood in your stool. Um, and um, so it's probably a little bit more advanced and, and severe. Uh, IBS is can be quite um, uh, pretty pretty horrible too. You know, you can and the problem with IBS is it's harder to diagnose. With I, with IBD, you can see the inflammation in the bowel. Uh, it's, it's very obvious that something's not right. With with IBS, there is no active inflammation in the bowel. So these people can have the same kind of condition, lots of diarrhea, lots of pain, bloating, discomfort and in, in digestion. Um, but, you know, it's more common for someone with IBS, the doctor will go, oh, that's in your head or, you know, it's, I can't really see anything wrong in your bloods and, and things like that because it's not as obvious. But um, the solution is pretty similar. Um, you know, it's all about it's all about fixing the fixing the underlying root cause of what causes the digestive discomfort, which is which is the improper diet and lifestyle, which causes uh, disturbance to your microbiome and other aspects of your body, who causes toxic damage inside the inside the bowel, and then yeah, you have you get the the, the discomfort. Uh, you know, from our perspective, when people get symptoms, this is a signal, this is a sign that your body's telling you that something's not right. That something we're doing is not right. And if we're able to address, change the diet, diet and lifestyle to what the evidence tells us works, which is a whole food plant exclusive diet. Um, when you've got digestive discomfort, you do want to be a bit careful. You don't want to be eating some of the uh, more insoluble and rougher fibers, you know, staying away from a lot of the fatty foods, um, but focusing mostly on soft uh, starchy foods, potatoes, sweet potatoes, yam, squash, and fruits like bananas and uh, papayas and melons. Um, these seem to be the best types of foods um, to help sleep the gut. What about rice? I, I don't have IBS. Yes, rice have is, IBS and yes. I find when I have a flare, white mm. rice just is like my comfort food. Rice, oh yeah, there's there's some very good evidence around rice. Um, uh, in fact, if you, um, yeah, there's a lot of programs out there that promote brown rice just sort of ex almost exclusively for IBD and they seem to have a good amount of success. Um, when people start our program and they transition 
start our transition diet, rice is definitely included in that and people do see some good results. Um, we prefer brown rice because it's more of a whole food, but um, white rice in certain situations, as you just mentioned, can be very effective too because it doesn't have some of the harsher fibers um, going through. So it's a, it's a progression. If someone's been having white rice for a long period of time, we start to get them to introduce small amounts of brown rice into that. And then you kind of slowly move to eating um, fully brown rice. I know that brown rice is healthier, but nothing tastes <laughs> better than white basmati rice. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, really? you and my wife, you, really? you and my wife are on the same page there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can't beat it. Okay. So we it's have. One, some- in fact, it's one of the one things that, um, that um, you know, my wife's like, I'm not gonna we have indian food it yeah. has to be with white basmati rice of that's the only one does. compromise <laughs> she knows what she's talking about <laughs> so aubrey says ibd at such a young age it's the standard aussie diet as much as the standard american diet mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so yeah. you know you talk about getting to the root cause when like when your brother went to the doctor or when other people with these conditions do they ever say what they think caused it they're the doctors yeah, what do they think? Causes uh, it? The doctors say they don't know what causes it. <laughs> That's because they haven't taken your course. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's it's pretty standard answer in the medical profession that we don't know what causes autoimmune conditions, um, and that unfortunately the body's attacking itself, and there's nothing we can do about it except for give you these medications. Um, so. Um, that's that's the kind of standard line that most people get when they go to the doctor. I don't know what this is, but Elizabeth says, do, did you have to use the FOB diet? The FOB diet. I don't know what that is no, either. I don't know what the FOB diet so is. So that's uh, please uh, explain your acronym, please, so yes. that we can uh, we can go further with that question. And let's see, I know I saw some more questions coming up. Just let me scroll through them. I was going from the beginning of the show. FODMAP uh, diet? Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe. Elizabeth, you're still there. FODMAP diet? Clarify. Um, so FOB you... foods, yeah, FODMAP diet, I think. Maybe FODMAP. I think what you mean. Uh, no, we don't recommend the FODMAP diet. Um, in fact, uh, where I live, it's about 10 minutes down the road is Monash University where they invented the FODMAP diet. I actually get emails <clears> from them for some reason, yeah. And um, so Monash University and their guidelines say that the FODMAP diet should not be used for more than two weeks because it's a very restrictive diet. Uh, and so it's only meant to be used to uh, give yourself some time to reduce the symptoms until you can find out what your solution is. Okay. Unfortunately, what's happened is that uh, people have gone on this train because it does reduce symptoms for short, for a short amount of time. People jump on this train and think, well, I'm going to follow this for a long period of time. And what that ends up doing, we've got this whole industry around FODMAP foods, which, uh, which I find is not ideal. Uh, and so because you're reducing your fiber intake, you're reducing the variety of different foods in your diet. And these FODMAPs are some of the healthiest foods, you know, as long as your, you know, your gut's healthy enough to digest them, uh, by avoiding them long-term, you're actually causing more disruption to your gut than, than improvement. Mm, Thank you. Michelle says, I stopped yeast and my Crohn's is in remission for two years. I had moderate severe disease and biologic never changed my disease. I've been whole food plant-based for 10 years. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. There is some research out there that, that yeast can really affect um, Crohn's disease. And in fact, um, Dr. Greg has a very good video on why people who have Crohn's should avoid nutritional yeast. Mm, nice. Yes, I do remember. And Dr. Goldhammer says the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we, we recommend the same. We don't recommend yeah. having any kind of yeast or nutritional yeast for people who've got Crohn's. Right. Uh, Carol Ann says, is diverticulitis related to IBD? And if gallbladder has been removed, can that open the door, so to speak, to IBD? Okay, so diverticulitis, I believe, is a type of inflammatory bowel condition. So yes, it is an IBD, uh, but in, instead of the IBD being on the inside of the colon, you get these pockets on the outside of the colon, uh, which can cause a lot of pain, discomfort. Um, and um, yeah, it's pretty debilitating um, to have diverticulitis. Uh, we've helped many people with diverticulitis and results are spectacular within, you know, within a month, one to three months, people have you know, almost got rid of their digestive complaints and their discomforts um, just by adding the fiber into their diet. 
Um, if you go to our YouTube channel at High Carb Health, there's a really good testimonial from a lady who, uh, from New Zealand who had diverticulitis. And the funny thing was that just before she started with that, she'd been hospitalized three times that year with flare-ups. And after she started her diet, within three months, she was completely symptom-free and didn't, hasn't been to the, I mean, I'm still in touch with her. She hasn't been to the doctor for her diverticulitis. And I think this was, this was years ago that we worked with her. So. Nice. Yeah. Fantastic. Susanna says, can Crohn's, colitis, and IBD come on at any age or are certain age groups or certain sexes perhaps more susceptible? It can come on at any age. So we've worked with people anywhere. Our youngest client is two years old and our oldest client is somewhere around 75. So yep, it can come on at any age, but there is a specific age group that is more susceptible and it's really, you know, late teenagers to 25. Um, seems to like between 20 and 25 this is the time when most people tend to be diagnosed that's when your um, brother was diagnosed yep yep so mo yeah most of the people we deal with are in their early 20s wow that's too young to be so sick mm. uh, Susanna says what do you think brought on your brother's condition uh it was it was his diet and lifestyle you know um so what happened was we ate the standard American diet lots of meat lots of dairy uh Shamiz is a huge fan of drinking milk. Uh, and um, he, you know, protein shakes, going to the gym, as all young men, um, a lot of young men do. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we just didn't look after ourselves, you know, alcohol, soft drinks, fast food. Um, and uh, when he was in Japan, he significantly increased his intake of raw fish. Um, but, because that's quite um, common over there. Um, and stress plays a role too. He was living away from home in a new, new place. So just um, diet, I, we always tell people there's, five, there's actually five things that you need to be aware of with, with all kinds of disease, but um, IBD is the, is the food you eat, so diet, number one. The second one is hydration. So you know, how much water are you drinking um, and how well hydrated are you? The third one is sleep. Sleep is something that I find is hugely underrated when it comes to health. And um, in today's world, we're really not getting enough sleep. You know, there's so many distractions um, with when it comes to like television and phones and lots of things to watch and, and do. Uh, but if you don't get enough sleep and you're not getting your seven to nine hours uh, every day, um, I'd say, you know, I really recommend getting close to eight or nine a day seven's still kind of touch and go yeah. um you, you don't your body's not able to do a lot of the recycling and, and toxin removal and healing work uh, in the early hours in the morning that's very very important for long-term health and um i think you'll you also find out with your work with weight loss people who um don't get enough sleep um you know you got lots of problems hormone imb imbalances and, and things like that that happen because of it um, so the third one is sleep. The fourth one is exercise and just moving your body. Now, if you're in a flare with IBD, you don't want to be doing a lot of exercise, but just anything gentle you can do to get outside and go for a walk, um, even if it's for 10 minutes is great. Uh, and the fifth one is your mental health. Okay, so, you know, we know there's a direct um, link from our brain to our gut. It's called the vagus nerve. And when we're stressed, our body doesn't digest our food as effectively. So, you know, you could be eating the healthiest food, but if you're stressed out, it's, it makes it harder to digest and that, that can cause problems and dis discomfort and digestion as well. You know, like, it's so funny because when I work with people with like, let's say they're emotional eaters, I don't get how anybody eats when they're upset because mm. when I'm upset, it's almost like my stomach just turns off, mm. you know? And like, I won't even get hungry for, it's like, it's almost like it's telling me, Hey, don't put food in here. Now we're upset. Mm. You're not going to be able mm -hmm. to digest this. And it's almost mm. like it shuts, shuts off for like 24 hours. I don't see how people <laughs> eat when they're upset. Cause it's like, it seems like impossible. Mm. So yeah. So I mean, I used to be quite an emotional eater. I think it's quite, um, it's a, it's a way of numbing your emotions in a way. That's yeah. what I found it did for me anyway. Um, so if you had a tough day at work or you had a rough month or whatever, you know, having, having that, uh, you know, whiskey and Coke or that ice cream or the chocolate pudding or whatever it is yeah. just kind of numbs you, you know, you kind of, yeah. Uh, whereas what I found was when I shifted to the plant-based diet and eating these healthy foods, you're not, you can't um, suppress those emotions anymore. So you have to be more with yourself and be more able to confront what's yeah. going on in the mind. 
Yeah, that's why they say gut feelings, you know, mm-hmm. gut feelings, you know. OK, so mm-hmm. Susan, who's watching live, says, is mucus excreted by itself without stool or discomfort a bad sign? Yeah, yeah, you don't you don't ideally you don't want that um, to be going on long term. It's a it's a symptom. It's a sign that the body's trying to remove something from the gut um you don't want yeah you essentially you don't really want that happening long term um part of the healing process can be mucus being removed blood and mucus being removed um from the body um but it's not normal to see only mucus coming out in your stool like um some people will have small amounts of mucus in their stool um you know as a as a regular thing but i don't think um yeah just uh, exclusively mucus discharge is not necessarily healthy. So if people want to find out more about your program, do you work with people individually, groups, both? What, how can they learn more? Uh, at the moment, we're only doing one-on-one uh, work. Uh, so you can go to our website, highcarbhealth.com. There's a link there to a free consultation with my brother, Shamiz. Uh, and uh, we find it's very helpful to have a chat um, and kind of get an idea of what the program involves and, and what you can expect as you go through this journey. Uh, and um, we will, I think we eventually look at doing group coaching things as well, but um, at the moment it's just the one-on-one coaching that uh, we've got going on. Um, but yes, highcarbhealth.com. Uh, if, uh, and then you do a free consult. And then if you want to join up, um, there's a process that you have to follow to, to join up. There's so many doctors now that are both plant-based and GI doctors. Are they aware of your work? They are. Yeah. Most of them are aware of us. Um, you know, we've been in contact with Dr. Desmond, Dr. Balsiewicz, um, Dr. Mendez, um, Dr. Sadegi. So yeah, we're then most of them are aware of um, who we are. Yeah. That's great. Well, congratulations on that. And uh, other than going to your website, are, is there a certain social media platform that you are more active on if people want to follow you? Absolutely. So if, um, you know, we are all about being as transparent as we can about what we do, um, because with social media, it can be quite hard to kind of, we want to try and build that trust with our people who follow us. So uh, what we do is if you follow us on Instagram and you click on our stories, you will get to see everything that Shamiz eats every day and what he does so every time he goes on exercise he'll he'll give you an update he'll show you what he's doing he'll show you all the foods that he eats and um you'll see the odd one pop up from me as well about what i do i've got two kids so sometimes i forget um but um yeah so we sh- we're kind of wanting to kind of show people what this lifestyle looks like what it's all about and obviously uh we post informative um posts on the instagram page as well and youtube is the other platform so if you follow us on youtube uh, you will get to see lots of different videos, informational videos, testimony videos, people healing from these diseases. We've got more than a hundred video testimonials of people healing from ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease on our YouTube channel. So there's a playlist there. Um, and the new thing that uh, we've just introduced last year, which you've been on Chef AJ is the podcast. So if you search for the podcast IBD heal on Spotify, um, you'll um, there's lots of really interesting uh, podcasts from amazing people in the health field like chef aj other doctors and also inspirational healing stories from people who've been able to heal all sorts of different conditions on a whole food plant exclusive diet right. how old are your children uh in, in, they're a week away from being five and two so okay. yeah five and two and they were raised on this diet from conception so your wife had plant-based pregnancies mm-hmm. yeah and incredible. everything went really smoothly um yeah they're really healthy they're growing well uh you know and they they love to they love to eat this way they really enjoy eating fruits and vegetables and grains and beans and nuts and seeds and they're just thriving and um yeah it's 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 fantastic um it's i I feel that i'm jealous of them you know because they're their gut microbiome you know they're breastfed you know um you know natural deliveries plant-based foods from 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 the beginning and healthy food from the beginning. So yeah, hopefully they don't have to go through some of the things that I went through through my adolescence and early twenties with my health conditions um, as they get older. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, every guest, um, Shukul pretty much gets this question. What do you eat in a day? What do I eat in a day? Well, I eat a lot of fruits. So 
um, you know, when, when I first started this diet, I found out about David Klein, who was a raw vegan. And I looked into the 80, 10, 10 diet from Dr. Douglas Graham. And um, then I found the China study after that and start solution after that. And I just kept reading and reading. So um, we've in, I've incorporated the best of both. So the best of the raw food diet plus the start solution diet. So we're basically eating a lot of fruit um, most of the day. And then in the afternoon to evening, we will have, um, you know, fruit, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds. So we eat the whole variety of whole plant foods. And um, as I said, if you want to see, you can actually see exactly what we eat every single day on Instagram. So you click on that story and you can, on the stories and you'll see every single meal um, that Shamiz and I eat, um, or 80% of my meals and, and, you know, all of Shamiz's meals um, on the Instagram stories. Wow. Well, maybe it's time for a cookbook. What? With the yes. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's. Uh, yeah. If you if you want that, you know, let um, Chef AJ know because um, it's something we're thinking about. Um, Want to know how many people would be interested in it? Well, I think that'd be great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the work you do. And if anybody ever came to me with these problems, I would say go to you because you guys really are the expert. And your brother's story is just so remarkable. I'm surprised nobody's written it up in a medical journal. Yes, I think it's happening. <laughs> yeah, That's it's great. underway. Yeah, yeah. But um, he, yeah, we'll... he may hold the world's record for the most colonoscopies in the shortest period of time, too. He may well do. <laughs> yeah. I you mean, never know. I've had two of them and I'm like, I'm never having one. I don't care. I, I mean, I said to the doctor, I'm just not, I, there's no way I'm going through that again. It's one of the mm. worst things, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And I saw that Dr. Medugal posted a very good um, video about. Was it on your show or was it somewhere else? I can't remember about colonoscopies. Um, but um, yeah, he had some very good advice for people who are considering colonoscopies. And I suggest you look up um, that that video, that article that Dr. Mayu yeah, did he about He did a presentation once, I think it was called Up the Wrong Butt, something like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah, yeah. You've got to be very careful. It's not something you should just do for the sake of it. Not just for fun. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so yeah, much. Absolutely. This has just been a wonderful presentation and people are asking where they can get it and get it right here on YouTube. You can just watch it again right away after the show's over. Many times as you want. Yeah. Yep. And many people are <laughs> at least three people, uh, uh, Carol and Denise and Leah and Ida, they all say, and Susanna say, yes, a cookbook. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone. Yeah. Appreciate that. Great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Chef AJ. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we also have a double header at 11 a.m. We have Justin Bellamy and the people that bring you the Holistic Holiday at Sea Cruise, which is sailing again in 2023. And at 2 p.m., we have Dr. Andy Klonicky, who's going to be making the best.